We only had 15, so we bought in early, so we feel that this would be a good good perk for the people to play golf over the age of 80. It's struggle. Any yes. concerns? Yes, sir. At the uh, golf uh, JAC meeting, uh, I asked the question of, um, and, and uh, that the question still remains, uh, in the fourth line of the policy, it says this is a summer program that will run, summer, a test summer program that will run from April 1st through October 31st. And David kindly pointed out that that, that was the time period. But it does say that that's the time period for the te test program. Po program. Uh, the start of, or the delay in the start from, to, from today to April 1st, it was my understanding that that was to, uh, being done because winter conditions uh, would show w more wear and tear on the fairways. Correct. What, what we have on our golf courses is Bermuda grass. It doesn't grow right now, and if you actually get out there with the rain we have, it's pretty thin out there. So if we've, Keith and I visited, we felt that this would be a growth program stop May, that Bermuda starts popping in. This won't damage the product we have out there for our customers. Okay, so my question is, mm -hmm. uh, I can understand that delay, but does that mean that if it's successful, that it would, going forward, it would only allow the new policy to be in place during the months of April through October? Going forward, not like if it, let's say it's successful, and everybody likes it, then next year, are we going to end it in October and not start it up again until April well, and, and keep that winter period uh, reserved for p only people with, with handicaps? Uh, what, what we'll do, Pat, is that's a good question. Uh, we'll look at the usage of it. You know, we don't know where this is going to go, whether we have 100 people sign up or if we have 30 people sign up. If we have 30 people sign up and we have a good winter, good growing season, when we roll through November, Keith and I will visit, look at it and say, okay, we had 30 people sign up. Is this going to hurt our product? Okay. It's not going to hurt our product. We maybe stretch it. If we have 120 people and we have a bad summer, something goes on, we've got to look at that. You know, if we give up the product that Keith works so hard to give to our membership and our customers, I don't want to give that up as well. But we, we, it will, this is our test. Right. right. So we okay. will definitely visit at the end of summer and see where we are on that. Okay. Thank you very much. That's welcome. Good clarification. Pat, are you aware of there are two golf seasons, according to groups, et cetera, that the winter group is now in effect? They start in October and they end in April or the first of the end of uh, March. And yes, then the I summer am. group starts some the other. So yes. it kind of coincides with the groups as well as the course conditions. Well, but, <laughs> but still, um, uh, it, it, my, the, the concern that was expressed is that since uh, it would be pre-growing season, there may, may be more damage uh, if it's widely used during the winter. And so I, I just was, Daryl's clarification, that they'll re-examine the situation at the end and determine the extent of the of the uh, period, time period in which it'll be effective is a good one. So. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? We don't vote on this. It's policy, or it's we do vote. No, no. we don't. The board. Well, we just kind of want a consensus to make sure that everybody's in agreement that this is a good. Everybody in agreement. Okay. Well, I want to thank the board for listening to us and the member that came forward, Mr. Bill King, brought it to us, shows we listen and I appreciate your time. Thank you and very we much. I appreciate the GAC thank for you, taking Darryl. it on. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, next up on the agenda, we, uh, I, I was approached by a property owner that uh, wanted us to uh, expand the statistical reporting that we provide on uh, the POA's website. And so what we plan on doing is uh, at next month's meeting presenting some draft um, new statistical, statistical reports uh, for the board to consider uh, and then determine if we want to implement those. So I just want to want the board to be aware that uh, we're trying to accommodate uh, this request. It appears to be a reasonable request um, and we'll go forth from there. Okay. Questions or comments? Tom, I've got one uh, question on that. So we provide the information uh, to the public 
um, and they have the rightful access to that. What about their representation of that information, uh, whether they break it out in their own graphical uh, look and see? I know we, we provide just raw data oftentimes, just the spreadsheet. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I don't know if there's anything uh, that we have in place or that we're thinking about. So if I was to take that information, I was a member and I was to make it into a different bar graph or a different pie chart or a different type of graphical presentation of that information um, and then that is disseminated um, throughout I think we'll, I think what we're seeing on the request for this is because people want to make a better judgment on the financial being of the POA and so of what I've witnessed out there in the public is that they're taking these numbers and they're trying to make their own analysis by them and then presenting them in new ways so we may have some sort of, I don't know if we can have a check and balance on this. We obviously can't control or we can maybe attempt to ask to verify if somebody wants to represent these numbers in a new graphical way. Or we may pursue different ways that we can provide options to look at those same numbers past the raw spreadsheet mm -hmm. so we can somewhat meet them in the middle on that. Because that's where I think a lot of people struggle because not everybody learns. Um, to view the, the statistics that way. That's why they came up with the pie chart. That's why they came up with the bar graph. So, and it's only getting more progressive with the onset of infographics. So we should think about how to make sure that we deliver that information so it's clear to many types of learners uh, on how it's presented, in my opinion. I think that's a real good point. Um, you can't you, you can't control how someone's going to interpret the information, but also I don't think that hiding the information is is the answer. Um, if I could um, offer though that um, if if there is a situation, for instance, uh, John Nuttall uh, brought up um, a disparity in a number that was grow seemed to be growing artificially or without explanation. And I would suggest that what we do is when we, when we have these situations, if we're going to release the data, if there are situations where that occurs, that we asterisk the, the data and uh, have, a, have a reference to a footnote that says uh, the, the disparity caused between this and this is, is due to a very simple explanation, not a large amount of detail. But it, in the case of, of John's stuff, uh, Tom, you responded and gave him a, a good explanation of what had happened. I can just see that happening with other people, you know, that there is a perfectly understandable explanation for the, the data variations, and yet at the same time, without being privy to the reason for that, that people may draw false conclusions. And so it would be a good idea if, if there are instances like that where they are informed of the reason. I think if you look at how the, um, the rounds report has, has evolved in a short amount of time where the board had asked us to ask management to put together a, a rounds report and then within a month or two, then they, the, the board came back and said, why don't you add some clarifying context yes. to it? Um, which called out, you know, look at this number is up or this number is down and this is why. Um, so I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Yes. Um, and so I, I think what we do is let's de develop the, the draft version of just the numbers themselves and then maybe maybe the second iteration is where we take it to the next level and provide some, some yeah, that'd be great. explanation. Uh, yeah. But I don't want to start doing the whole, you know, let, let, let's get Let's get step one completed, and then we'll work on step two, almost like what we did with the, the golf report. Right, and you could just publish the raw numbers, and if, uh, if issues are raised, uh, uh, how much attention any individual members is paying to those numbers will be uh, cause for giving fuller explanation, you know, but let's not just jump into it where we try to answer all the questions to begin with. I think that's a great point. And we have analytics on our website where we can see where, where um, 
what is more popular and less popular. Right. Um, you know, I, I remember last year we pulled up that only 50 people uh, had clicked on our budget. I thought that was a fairly low number. Um, but, uh, you know, clearly, you know, are we going to invest a huge amount of time on something that's receiving very limited attention? I mean, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, next, uh, Doug's going to talk about three modifications to our uh, pol to, to three different policies, actually two modifications and one new policy. So I'll have him take it over. Um. Pat approached me several months ago about a concern that he had with our um, board member director removal procedure and really that there was it was lacking um, so he and I've worked for several months to, to kind of put something together that we could present to the rules and regs committee and um, that really we didn't really have a very good process for for removal of a, of, a, of a director if there was an issue and also there was really nothing in there that talked about a, a discipline of a, of a director if that was warranted so we um, we put together an, a change uh, policy 1.10 previously had you know the outline of, of how that removal process was to take place so I felt like it deserved its own policy, so I removed part of 1.10 and, and added something, uh, another statement there, um, but took part of 1.10 and created a new policy, 1.12, which is now called a disciplinary procedure for directors, so it's not just removal, but it also covers disciplinary procedures, including removal. Um, so if you read 1.10 and 1.12 in in concert with each other, those uh, those policies now will reflect uh, what we feel like is a good um, a good procedure now, step by step procedure for a disciplinary process for directors if that should happen. Um, and we we presented that to the Rules and Regs Committee, um, Jim. If you want to give an update, we had uh, a couple of meetings on that had some changes, went back and forth and had changes, and I believe it was a recommendation of the, of the rules and regs to bring it forward to the, to the full board. Not yet. We, uh, we had two rules and regulation committee meetings uh, recently, and we're posing this, really, uh, we did have four of the board members uh, in attendance, three three on the committee and one also attended, and we, what we're asking the board full board to do now is look at this draft and help finalize so that we can we can begin the process of the readings very quickly. Whether that happens at next week's meeting or not, but I'd invite each of the board members to to look at the draft that uh, rules and regulations committee has adopted. And, and also we, we looked at policy 6.02 regarding disclosure of information um, and so we made a slight modification to that as, as well and that was part of part of part of the the revision to policy 1.10 and the creation of policy 1.12 as well and again that went through the same process with the rules and regs committee um, they voted unanimously to, to present these to the full board and so um, that's what we're doing today. Regarding the disciplinary action, as I read it um, a couple of times, it's more of an outline as to the various steps in detail rather than generalities. So it's, it hasn't changed from what we've done in the past. It's just kind of modified it and made it step by step. Correct. Okay. Um, the policy still remains that it, it's up to the board, the full board, to vote on any disciplinary, um, any disciplinary uh, action that would be handed down. Okay. So it's still uh, that power remains with the board, but it just, like you said, it outlines, it outlines a little step bit further step. steps, and uh, I, I feel like provides the board further options. You know, not just removal, but here's several suggestions that the board could take okay. for a discipline 
where where previously it really only covered removal. Correct. It didn't it didn't talk about any options. Yeah, I'll tune in just for a second on this as being part of the rules and regulations meetings. Um, I felt like there was a considerable amount of effort that went in to this, and I was happy to see so much thought because it wasn't to me just discipline; it was also growth mechanisms for people and chances to come to clearer understandings. It wasn't just disciplinary in this in the in that outline that Doug and Pat has worked on. To me, showed a, a high level of of caring about the board members as well and their growth in the role. And sometimes through the course of so much that's happening in, in the POA and the community, uh, many, many times it's an opinion or uh, an effort of an individual board member that may need called to attention. Uh, it doesn't always result in needing disciplinary action as much as it needs further clarification and, and time spent. So I was, I was happy to see that those efforts uh, went, went that direction. Other comments? Um, I, if you, if uh, those of you who have not been on the Rules and Regulations Committee meeting will find that there's a form uh, at the end of the thing that's uh, titled Misconduct Allegation Form. And that that is uh, uh, to keep uh, any um, charge in written form that it's got to be submitted. It's not just a, a griping thing, you know, where you come before the board and you say, uh, you know, Jerry Hover's been, you know, you know, or, uh, you know whatever, or, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, if someone has an, has an allegation to make that there was misconduct, they complete the form, and the form is submitted to the board of directors. So it keeps it at a, uh, a more documented level you know, we know exa exactly what the what the charge is, and we don't we don't have to get involved in conversations during board meetings t for clarifications or things like that before the charge is actually submitted to the board. I forgot what you did, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding well, <laughs> is everything that's on this would still be in executive session. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Except for the, the voting, uh, right. whatever the whatever the, the outcome outcome of that okay. would be disclosed at, okay. at a full meeting okay. as it passed. So. Any other questions or comments? So two quick things. Uh, so uh, Jim touched on this. The approval process, uh, assuming the board uh, does not object, this would go forward at uh, next week's meeting. Uh, it would uh, potentially be voted upon. Uh, if approved at that time, it would then go to next month's meeting. And uh, if it's approved uh, for the second month in a row, then it would uh, become policy. Uh, for property owners that are interested in, uh, in these changes, uh, proposed changes, they can go on to the POA's website. If they go, uh, go to the governance section, they will see uh, where, where there's a, a tab that you can click on and it says uh, policies under consideration or con considered to be changed. And those, uh, according to Leah, are already available on the POA's website. So if you'd like to get more information regarding these changes, you can go forward and, and do the research on your own. Uh, one other point. Um, because we're thinking about bringing it up at next week's meeting, it would behoove the board to take careful, uh, give careful consideration to this. And unless there are anything other than grammatical changes, to get back to, to Doug and Tom uh, as soon as possible so that it it can't be, a, if there are significant concerns and you haven't hit, those haven't uh, arisen today, then we know we can't, can't move forward at next week's meeting for a reading because those concerns, it would have to be presented back to the board again. Isn't that, wouldn't that be correct? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other comments? So it'll be moved to next week's board unless somebody has objections at a later time or changes. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, if Jerry could give us a, a little update on uh, the archery range development that he's been working on with a number of people. Okay, as far as the update on it, uh, we've had two meetings in the last several months uh, with uh, individuals from the community and the POA concerning uh, the establishment of an outdoor archery range. 
And as it stands right now, uh, we've looked at a number of sites and narrowed those down to uh, three separate ones uh, that appear to be the, some of the best fit. And that would be one out near the current gun range, one off of uh, Nelly Road, and one on the very edge of the Arkmo property. Uh, we now have, through the, the meetings, uh, a pretty good idea of what the needs are for both short term and long term. And now it's a matter of uh, bringing all the folks together uh, and ar arriving upon what kind of a design that we'd be looking at uh, and then moving it forward through the Recreation Committee. Myself, I'm a resource person to the Recreation Committee. The committee themselves are the ones that are taking the lead upon this. Is there any questions? It's pretty brief. Uh, Jerry, you, it, it's interesting. You said a word uh, as you were beginning your presentation uh, that I had never even thought about. Uh, you, you said outdoor ranges, mm -hmm. okay? Is there any possibility or is there any desire to try to locate something within the confines of our current recreation buildings that might be used as an archery range for indoor shooting? You know, I don't even know if that's feasible. But um, I was thinking like, um, let's say, a, um, uh, one of the handball courts, you know, some, some, something could be arranged where the handball court could be used for target practice or something, let's say, at, at Reardon Hall. I, I don't know, you know, I'm just offering that as a, uh, an, uh, asking if there was any, thought being given to indoor shooting at the present time there's not any request for any further indoor facilities okay they appear to have the uh, like the hook line and sinker as a, a course inside many of the schools have courses inside the problem is they do not have anything outside okay so that's why we're concentrating upon the outside rather than inside okay thank you uh, Jerry, are we taking a step-by-step -step approach on this? And, and, and what I mean by that is uh, start small and go big, or are we looking at uh, enough acreage, as an example, that you could do everything that you wanted by way of uh, an archery range, uh, you know, from, from short range to longer range? I, I don't know what it all involves. At the current time, we're actually looking at all, all of the possibilities. Uh, you know, if we find a permanent site, then that's a long-term uh, process, but we may start with a simple uh, short uh, target range rather than including the uh, uh, field archery courses that would go with that. But part of it also depends upon uh, you know, if grants can be uh, obtained, then maybe we need to go for all of it. If uh, the group does not come together uh, and formalize everything, then it'll probably bounce back to uh, the POA in budgeting for it in current, uh, another year, two years down, down the line. So there's a lot of ifs and involved in it yet. So the next meeting uh, will be uh, scheduled currently for March 16th. Yeah. Um, and then try and put a few more of the dots over the I's and crossing a few more of the T's. I'll tune in just a second on this as being involved in a number of different archery discussions across the region and, and um, having invested in the equipment and, and spent a fair amount of time at it myself. I, I, when I think of Bella Vista, in, in many ways, I kind of have almost the uh, Boy Scout manual in front of me because there are just so many great things you can do here um, in, the, in terms of outdoor recreation and outdoor knowledge and just growing up 
in this area, many of our scouting adventures happened at Bella Vista. And it kind of is surprising that archery hasn't been a part of the conversation up here, especially since it's one that you can continue to carry on throughout the ages. And I'm excited for Jerry's efforts here uh, to get something more formalized to offer as another amenity base here. I think it, it's actually going to be uh, a well-used thing and something that we'll see um, some considerable growth um, if we get something done. So hopefully <coughs> it won't take two years, and, and I'm confident we'll find a location uh, this year. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited to see it come down. Thank you, Jerry, for working on it. Any other comments? Any other suggestions? Input. Thank you, Jerry. Doug, why don't you call for the next one? Okay. So the next one on the agenda is uh, planning for a lot sale event. Um, as you know, we have about 600 lots in our, that the PLA owns in our inventory. Um, and a number of those are less than desirable for building. They're either steep or remotely located. So we, we have, don't have very good success in selling those lots. So what we're positioning for the last week of March is what we're calling, we haven't named it yet, we're still developing the, the plans for this, but it's a, a, a membership drive, um, something of the, that sort. I'm not the marketing person, but uh, as you know, if you own, to be a member of the, of the POA, you have to own property. So we're, we're hoping that we can push this and market this and sell, sell these lots that are, you know, essentially not buildable uh, for, for membership uh, so that people can have access to the, to the amenities. And we're looking at doing a, a blowout sale of, of, of a re greatly reduced price but so that we can entice people to be members of the POA and, and use our amenities. So that's scheduled for the last week of March and we're continuing to develop plans for that. So if anyone have questions about that? Small synopsis. Um, if you're if you're going to have this blowout sale, and you mentioned that the um, the lots are a varying um, buildability, if you would, mm -hmm. um, are you going to when you have the sale, are you going to have a, a rating assigned so that uh, let's say a lot is fully un unbuildable mm -hmm. versus a lot that that with significant engineering could be buildable? are some which are now readily buildable so that people when they're coming forward to look at what stock is available have some idea without having to travel out to the, the side of the lot before they so are. so right now our, our lot sales website has a number of lots listed on it and it, sh it has um, instructions for you to go on the GIS county website and you can get elevations and see how steep it is um, I don't think we want to get in the, the rating system. We could open ourselves up to, you know, okay. that's, that's a subjective yeah. view. So um, what we will do is put the list out sufficiently ahead of time that they can, that they can go on GIS and look at the lot and assess for themselves. Um, so you'll, can, you'll, give suggest or rec you'll give a process by which they can get further information Correct. and give them their necessary references? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Jim has mentioned in the past that if it's a plotted lot, it's a buildable lot. Just depends on how much money you want to spend to right. to make it buildable. Yeah. Okay. But, but any of great value probably have been sold. <laughs> yeah, the ones the ones that you know mm -hmm. are 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 buildable. David does a really good job of getting those sold and um, okay. presenting the, those as that. the effective rating system for the lots. Of course, is the price. If, if the price is, you know, such and such that it's a readily buildable lot, that's different than a lot mm -hmm. that takes a, you know. So if you adjust the price, that's the rating system. In yeah, the, the two or three or four hundred that we make available through this sale will all have the same price, and it will be a very low price. We don't know exactly what that is yet. We're going to include, you know, it's going to include uh, deed preparation, recording costs, all that's going to be included, you know, the, what my department does, that all that all that cost will be included in the price, and then you know, so it's just a one flat purchase purchase price. One price shopping. <coughs> yeah, make it simple. And and we're developing a process online right now, which is m maybe more information that you want to know, but how they can select a lot and and pay for it right there online, and we can process their credit card and that type of thing. So we're 
moving through that whole system right now. Any other questions or comments? Update the stuff, though. Okay, so uh, last week uh, the uh, uh, POA's water department installed a water tap at uh, the Trafalgar Fire uh, site. Uh, now many people have come to us and said, well, well what does that mean? Uh, have, has the ADEQ told the POA how they're going, planning on uh, uh, remediating the situation? And no, we don't, we don't know any more information than what the specifics are regarding what their needs for the water tap. So we decided, you know, so they gave us the specs, we installed um, uh, it to those spec the specifications. Uh, we wanted to get it done as quickly as possible. I would much rather have the work finished and wait for the ADQ to actually start using it um, as opposed to ADQ being ready to go and waiting on us. So we moved forward very quickly and got that work done. Uh, and so it's ready to go. But uh, we're t I have not heard anything regarding what the specific plans are uh, for the use. Um, the next item is uh, tentatively there is a community uh, informational meeting uh, set up for February 12th at 6 p.m. at Reardon Hall. Uh, this is the group that put together the last meeting uh, in December, I think it was, uh, early December, uh, is the same group that's putting on this meeting. Uh, so uh, uh, add that information to your calendar. We'll have that on the POA's calendar also. Uh, with regards to the other, we're kind of calling them the other stump dumps. Um, uh, to differentiate from the, from the Trafalgar fire location. Uh, on three of those locations, uh, these are the locations that are all located within the city and boundaries of Bella Vista. And they've, uh, one was closed over 10 years ago and the other two were closed over 20 years ago. Uh, though all those sites have been uh, inspected by FTN, which is the company that uh, the POA hired uh, to do this work, and uh, they have submitted uh, uh, letters uh, to uh, ADQ on uh, how to go about uh, closing, officially closing those sites in the eyes of ADEQ. Uh, those letters were sent off to uh, them last week, and uh, we hope to hear back relatively soon. Uh, regarding the west side stump dump, FTN is uh, developing uh, plans uh, and they anticipate uh, they'll have those plans done within about a month on how to officially close the west side stump dump, officially close in the eyes of ADEQ. It's closed right now, you can't go and dump anything there, but in the eyes of ADEQ, we're trying to get it officially closed. That one's gonna be a little bit more intense uh, on how to close it, and, but we're waiting for those results back from FTN. They will then have to go to ADEQ for approval before we move forward with any uh, actions. Um, I encourage everybody to continue to consult uh, with the city's website. Um, uh, we're, that's what we're doing is we're directing everybody to that site. Um, we received uh, yesterday, uh, actually I'm sorry the day before, we received the uh, official results uh, where we uh, had hired a third party company to analyze the water quality to see if there was any issues with Lake Brittany and Lake Ann. Uh, we did this in uh, December. We had the city post that information to their website. We just got the second round of results. Those results are good also. Uh, and those were posted to the city's website yesterday. I sent it off to Cassie and she uh, accommodated my request in posting it to the set to the website. So I enc encourage everybody to utilize the, we the city's website for your source of information. Uh, Tom, would you address the reports we've had that the west side stump dump is, has fires or is burning or, I mean, I know it's been looked into. Um, so uh, I received a, uh, an email from a property owner last week. Uh, they were very concerned that uh, the west side stump dump may be on fire. We sent out uh, an employee within 30 minutes to, to look at it uh, and it was not the case. Um, in speaking with the uh, engineers from FTN, it is steam uh, from the 
decomposition of the organic material that is there. Anything else? Any other questions? If not, we come to once again to the open forum where property owners have their right to speak for three minutes. We'd entertain anybody. Nobody cares to speak to us? I do have time. John, go ahead and speak to us. Um, thank you for your work on the uh, policy changes. When I saw that on the uh, agenda two days ago, I quickly went to look and check about you know what the Rules and Regulations Committee was doing. And interestingly, I discovered they have not met for 18 months, according to the website. The rules and regs? Nope. March of 17 was the last time minutes were posted. We will get that fixed. And uh, Leah's, your change hasn't showed up yet. And um, a bit of, my, of a bitch on open meetings. I understand the rules and regulations committee can meet in private as they did this week, but I find it hard to believe that anything that happened in that meeting rose to the level that it should have been a private meeting and not a public meeting. Thank you. It didn't private meeting. It wasn't private. I don't know that, uh, Jim. It was not a. It was not announced as a private as a closed meeting, was it? Well, it wasn't announced as anything. Well, isn't it then best, best to assume that it's an open meeting unless it's identified as a closed meeting? The door said it was closed. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't look at the door. Anyone else? Bruce, go ahead. I, I had uh, uh, put something past uh, Tom the other day uh, relative to trying to ease the congestion uh, right here uh, between uh, the golfers and, and the users of the restaurant um, and and I appreciate Tom's reply to me uh, I was wondering if anybody else has any thoughts about uh, making more space available uh, so that we are not crowding each other out I haven't heard of any complaints yet from you know, restaurant goers coming in and saying, hey, golfers are taking our spaces. We're talking parking spaces. Parking, okay. parking, space, space. If we um, know of an event in advance, um, uh, we'll, now the employees are required to park on the third level, on the upper level. Uh, with that being said, if there is a large event that we know is coming, uh, what we'll do is we will have the employees park at Tanyard Creek and then we actually shuttle, shuttle them over. Um, with that being said, there's an occasional instance. We had one last week or the week before um, uh, where it was a seminar on scams and that received an overwhelming response from the community and we were surprised by it uh, and the host was also surprised. and, and um, uh, that maxed out the parking lot and we had a couple complaints um, so when we when we can anticipate it we try and uh, uh, make sure that we uh, move the employee cars because uh, that uh, reduces the number of spots or increases the number of stop spots available the challenge we have is that we're landlocked so we really can't add another level of parking uh, but there's definitely times that we could uh, use especially on large shotgun events uh, when we have like a double shotgun and so forth. Over the summer we have used, uh, if it's a long tournament or double shotgun, they have blocked off the restaurant areas until it's time for the restaurant to open. And so there's definitely spaces for restaurant people on those days so people don't fill both sides. And that's usually out of town people who weren't aware that the restaurant is locked off or blocked off until 11 o'clock. Mike, go ahead. Well, I was thinking of you know just customer service and is, is there and maybe in the future this summer when we anticipate great weather and, and the restaurant really humming and the golf course is really doing lots of business uh, instituting some sort of valet service um, just even hearing Daryl's commentary about uh, mm -hmm. handicap needs I see the, the same uh, opportunity there to offer 
um, an extended level of service. So. Let me follow up with, what, with Mike on that's kind of what I was thinking and, and we could probably use the lot over by Tanyard because it's rarely full and on those heavy days or we're, when we're anticipating a big tournament uh, and and you're still going to have the employees park over there and shuttle them you can shuttle golfers just like you can employees mm -hmm. send send the big cart over there bring their bags I'd be happy to do that because it's sometimes it's a lot easier than walking up the stairs somebody can come pick me up and drop me right mm -hmm. in my cart so maybe if you advertise it that way and you know maybe valet parking somebody you know it, maybe they'd pay 10 bucks to valet park, park their car. I don't know whether we want to charge for it because of an event, but if we can figure out a way to make a buck, why not? And, and let's remember, Tom, when, they, when he opened the uh, restaurant a year ago, almost, I think it was April, uh, he said the striping that was done to follow up is, is a test. So the striping may be adjusted here as the year progresses. There may be less for restaurant or more for restaurant or vice versa. So far, it seems to be working, but there are days that we run out. No denying that. Um, but, there, uh, but as long as we have enough advance warning, we can usually make adjustments. Oh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I just uh, uh, I worry when uh, uh, a warmer spring and a hot summer is upon us, mm -hmm. relative to uh, what's going on here, the golfers. Uh, the people who uh, want to partake of BV Bar and Grill, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, could become problematic. And uh, uh, as David suggested, and we all know, there's a huge lot down at Tanyard Creek. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I defer to you on the expense of actually running an, uh, a, a cart shack type operation out of, uh, out of Tanyard Creek to accommodate golfers that want to park down there. And, the, the expense and the and the control because how do you check them in and so forth um, the good news is we're talking about a good problem too many people want to <laughs> come here that's a good problem to have how about the irony of that oh, a restaurant that's got too many customers well I, I blame you be, for being a board member oh <laughs> yeah any other positive comments <laughs> Susan So I was um, thinking about the report that has been requested, and I think it's a great idea. Um, I mean, the one thing that I've liked about the golf report is the analysis, because if nothing else, it lets us know that you know what the numbers really say. Mm -hmm. And I think there will be much more interest and scrutiny on the, on the POA budget in the coming years because when you had 12 million dollars or whatever it is in reserves nobody cared but as our reserves have fallen there are more and more people who have an interest and i think an executive summary type report of uh what the monthly status is would be of great interest to a lot of members okay. uh, the other thing is on the uh policy which i like but it would be helpful if on the agenda maybe you could put a link to how you could get to the uh, information because, I mean, I go to the financials quite frequently and I still have to think about how it is that you get there. And if you're not familiar, you never find it. So just in the interest of transparency on them. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's a good point. If you're only going to the website a handful of times and you're, you're looking for this, you, it would, we, ha the good news is, is our website has a tremendous amount of information the bad news is uh, we have a tremendous amount of information and trying to find what you're looking for can be challenging. Any other? Go ahead, Jerry. I think, Susan, you have to uh, talk just briefly on the longest day. Oh, How much problem? Um, so um, I think most of you know that last year the uh, golf committee uh, approved a longest day tournament um, and we held that tournament and it, we raised about $10,000. And uh, that was the single largest uh, event that the longest day had in Arkansas. Um, and kind of as a result of getting involved in that, I'm now on the longest day committee. And um, so what we're going to try to do this year is expand the breadth of the events that we have in Bella Vista. Um, 
We have a lot of people in Bella Vista that are impacted by Alzheimer's, either themselves or their family members. Um, serious disease, it's growing and it's going to get worse in the short term. So uh, we're just at the beginning of the planning stages. And um, so I just sort of, the, this is sort of awareness um, that we're looking for people who might be interested in hosting events. And, and they don't need to be huge events. These can be, uh, you know, just a club day that you're doing something to raise money for Alzheimer's. Um, or a bike ride, or a kayak, or a paddle day, or a day at the beach, or whatever. Some, and we have lots of ideas, but we need, uh, We'll be soliciting for people to organize and promote the events or volunteer at them. Because uh, we want to get our donations up from 10000 up to the $25,000 range um, from Bella Vista this year. What date is it? Uh, the go golf tournament this year is the 17th of August. The longest day is all centered around uh, the solstice, which I think is the 20-somethingth of June, right? But the events can happen at any time. And... Uh, so uh, we, we're going to try and contact club members and organizations and that kind of thing. And the, uh, the Alzheimer's Association will help with getting things like corporate sponsors, especially general corporate sponsors, as opposed to, you know, the kayak shop or the bike shop, right? But uh, anyway, so I did, we just appreciate uh, support through, um, as uh, we do more publicity on it, and just wanted to make you aware that that's happening. Susan, I, I know Siobhan has left the Alzheimer's yeah. Association. Has she been replaced? Uh, they're, look, they're looking for a replacement. They've interviewed a number of people. Uh, she has not yet been replaced. So um, there are a few of us that are kind of carrying on in her absence. The uh, woman, uh, Carly, who does the walk uh, is kind of filling in for right now. Okay. Okay, so we had a meeting with our executive director last week. So thank you. Thank you. Any others? Any other comments, questions for the good of the cause? If not, regular board meeting is next Thursday at 6.30, the 24th. GM meeting for February is February 14th. Don't forget the chocolate. At uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, it's a closed meeting. The strategic planning committee is Tuesday, February 19th at 9 o'clock in the boardroom, and this also is a closed meeting. The work session is uh, two, Thursday, February 21st at 9 o'clock, and then the next board meeting for February will be the February 28th at 6.30. We stand adjourned. All right. Is that a request for something? It's a request. For demand. That was, it was, it was a request. You had the gavel in I had hand. The